the Department of Abnormalities. One question many people have when diving into the SCP universe is, how long has the SCP Foundation been around? The answer, like many things in this universe, is tricky. Not because the Foundation aren't fastidious record keepers, but more due to the fact that canon is fluid, and the nature of world-changing anomalies means that the Foundation likely has no idea how they really started, or what came before them. Case in point, the Department of Abnormalities, apparently an old branch of the SCP Foundation that the current Foundation knows practically nothing about. Since the entire Foundation is devoted to abnormalities, the name is a bit odd, but that's far from the only mystery here. This video won't be filled with answers about the group and what happened to them, but it will serve as a nice introduction. Let's start with the anomaly that introduced the Foundation to the Department, SCP-3790, a structure located beneath an abandoned warehouse in London, accessible by a short black door marked with a placard reading, SCP Foundation Department of Abnormalities. The rest of the file is locked by O5 order, but bypassing that, we learn that the structure consists of a number of descending levels, each containing a hallway and four rooms. The structure appears to have been abandoned for a considerable amount of time. Each door to the side rooms is heavy and made of metal, with a sliding panel covering a small glass viewport. Some of the doors are rusted, but all of them have had their handles and unlocking mechanisms removed, with some of them even having been welded shut. On the back of the main door is a clipboard holding a legal pad, on the front of which it reads, Think it's about time. Need to lock down the other sites before I go. Take care. The rest of the writing is a series of numbers, 1 through 10, with most of them listed as unlocked, and four of them as locked. We'll get to those later. The rest of the document contains descriptions of all of the small rooms across the seven floors, as seen through the viewports, and the name listed on the placards next to each door. The Foundation hasn't entered any of the rooms as of yet. Room 1 of Level 1 is listed as Vivaldi, and contains a single violin with a broken bow. Why the department would contain Vivaldi's violin is just one of many mysteries. Room 2 is listed as Montezuma's Face, containing an ornate wooden chest with gold inlays and a large steel lock sitting on a table, with a quiet clicking sound like that of a clock being barely audible. Your guess is as good as mine. Room 3 is empty, with no placard, while the placard for Room 4 has been damaged, with the chamber also empty although long gashes cover the walls and pieces of bone are visible on the floor, likely something that simply was abandoned there to die. On the second floor, room 1 is listed as Ian, and the chamber contains a thin, pale man in a straitjacket wearing a blindfold. Perhaps this is an alternate version of the Shy Guy, SCP-096. Room 2 is marked as The Crying Boy, containing a canvas with a sheet draped over it. The Crying Boy is a well-known painting that was linked to an urban legend, in which undamaged copies of it were found in the ruins of a number of burned houses. It seems that the department had an actually anomalous copy. Room 3 is listed as The Watchers, and contains three vaguely humanoid figures huddled in a far corner, looking away from the door. The figures can be seen shifting slightly. Again, possibly alternate versions of SCP-173, maybe even more akin to the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. Room 4 has no placard, and the room seems to consist of only another dark hallway. On level 3, room 1 is marked as the infinite cold, with the floor of the room covered in a thin layer of water, and the interior of the room seemingly considerably larger than its dimensions would allow. A couple of possibilities for this one, 
one being SCP-4812-E, an entity that lowers ambient temperatures around it to near absolute zero, or SCP-3799, a sphere that created anomalous snow which blanketed the world and killed humanity before its existence was reset. Room 2 is listed as Sorrow, and contains a pedestal with four parallel lines in the dust, consistent with finger marks, implying that whatever was resting on the pedestal had recently been removed. Again, your guess is as good as mine. Room 3 of level 3 is marked as World Without Man, and the chamber is empty. This refers to SCP-804, an anomalous art installation in Alaska consisting of a clear globe containing a number of smaller globes. When the installation is activated, the globes begin to rotate, causing all man-made artifacts within 100 meters to begin to rapidly deteriorate until disintegrated. This also affects human tissue at a slower rate. The area of effect grows over time, and it's believed that it could wipe out all trace of humanity in a matter of weeks, if not for the fact that it's not entirely immune to its own effect. It's possible that the version contained by the department destroyed itself, somehow, due to this. Room 4 is marked as Adam's Hatred, containing a billowing, indistinct black shape in the back of the room. Now is a good time to point out that the Department of Abnormalities is a part of the wider Cactusverse, as it's known, connected works from the author DJ Cactus. This one likely refers to Adam L. Assem, the first king of men, as we learned from SCP-4840, but what exactly it is, I couldn't say. Down in level 4 in the first room we have the Morning Star, with a rusted sword hanging on a rack in the back of the room, and the door to the room feels warm. A sword emanating heat named the Morning Star means that this was the sword wielded by 05-1 in the climax of the Way It Ends 001 proposal, which he recovered near the corpse of an angel in the Garden of Eden, Lucifer. It was broken during the events of that story, so it's a bit of a mystery as to how the department had a rusted version of it sitting here. Room 2, on the other hand, is listed as Wormwood, and the viewport is obscured, so we don't know what's in the room. This one refers to SCP-4008, ancient Davite seeds that grow massive trees, which make people forget about everything that existed in the trees area. So either the department contained one of these trees somehow and it's blocking the viewport, or looking into the viewport causes the viewer to forget what they saw, claiming it's obscured. Room 3 is marked as Harmonia's Necklace, and contains a simple golden necklace hanging on a post in the back of the room, lit by a single tall candle. The room does not appear to have a floor. In Greek mythology, the Necklace of Harmonia was a cursed object that brought great misfortune to a number of queens and princesses. The department seemed to contain a mix of different versions of currently contained SCPs, as well as things from myth that the Foundation have never seemed to find. Room 4 has no placard, the room is unlit, and people that look into it feel a lingering sense of dread. If we're looking at DJ Cactus SCPs that might not exist and provide a sense of dread, this likely refers to SCP-2740, an attic that maybe sort of exists and was maybe created out of pure hatred. Moving down to level 5, in room 1 we have the Heart of Man, a room containing a single, still-beating human heart suspended from the ceiling by a wire. The interior of the room appears to be distorted. This is possibly a reference to SCP-1983, an old farmhouse in which the interior is a distorted patchwork of multiple locations, and which contains shadow monsters that tear out people's hearts. I also might just be grasping at straws. The sliding panel for room 2 has been welded shut, and the placard has been pried off, with the word Hello, scratched into the metal where the placard should be. 
This seems to refer to SCP-3935, an anomalous space existing underneath the Salvation High School in Salvation, Indiana, that completely messed up the entire town. What exactly they have contained in there and how they contained it are pretty interesting questions. Room 3 is listed as Channel 55 and contains a small CRT television sitting in the center of the room with something plain on it, although a dark cloth has been draped over it. Possibly a reference to SCP-055 or Fifthism, but some of these are more clear than others. Room 4 is marked as Living Nightmare and contains a dirty twin mattress on a simple metal frame with a figure lying on the mattress and a sheet pulled over them. Again, I'm really not sure if this refers to an existing SCP, and it doesn't really have to. Level 6, Room 1, is listed as Mr. Silence, containing a tall black wooden box bound in chains and locks with a bright purple W emblazoned on it. Dr. Wondertainment has put out a number of anomalous humanoids in their Little Mister series, but Mr. Silence has never been mentioned outside of this chamber. Room 2 is listed as The Dead Man's Chair, containing a wooden chair with a faint shadow sitting in it, although it disappears upon a second viewing. 3 is marked as Utsi, with a layer of ice covering the viewport, and a dark shape barely visible in the middle of the room. Utsi is the oldest natural mummy that has currently been found in Europe, although that hardly makes him anomalous. Whether the department has some anomalous version of him in here, or it's something else, such as SCP-4812-E, is anyone's guess. Finally, Room 4 of Level 6 is listed as Apollyon's Crown, with a silver lockbox resting on the table in the middle of the room. The exterior of the door is covered in scratch marks, as if by something trying to get into the chamber. As we learned in SCP-4812, the Great House of Apollyon ruled all of Old Europe for hundreds of years, until King Saurus VIII von Apollyon grew bored and waged war against the fair folk across the sea. This calamitous mistake brought complete ruin to the Empire, and left behind some particularly nasty anomalies as explained in that article. In SCP-4840, we learn that this crown was actually pulled from another existence by Adam LSM, and proceeded to bring ruin to Adam's empire due to the great envy that his sons possessed for it. It seems that someone still lusted for it even fairly recently, and the fact that it's just sitting here in a room underneath a warehouse in London is rather shocking. That just leaves level 7. But even though the Foundation can see the seventh level through the graded floor of the elevator, the lift mechanism doesn't seem to go down to that floor. The article ends there, with no further information. Now, obviously, there's something more at work here than meets the eye, as the typical Foundation we know would not stop there. The fact that all of these rooms have not been cracked open, and the seventh floor has not been accessed, likely points back to the start of the document, where all of this information was locked by the O5 Council. The Council doesn't want to touch anything in here, doesn't want people to delve into the Department of Abnormalities, and especially doesn't want to know what's on the seventh level. Or something is actively dissuading them from accessing it. Let's look at some of the other Department of Abnormalities facilities none of which are quite as abundant with anomalies as that one. SCP-3220 is a large underground silo located underneath an abandoned warehouse in Japan. A hatch, marked with a placard reading Department of Abnormalities in Japanese, is in the middle of the warehouse and leads to a 50-foot deep shaft. The silo itself extends just over one kilometer into the ground and is 20 meters in diameter. It appears to be constructed in a manner similar to a panopticon, a structure that would allow a single individual to observe a large number of other individuals around them, without the other individuals knowing if they're being observed or not. 
The silo consists of 200 floors and a large tower that extends from the bottom floor to the top, constructed of opaque one-way glass. Each floor contains a number of cubic cells, with a drainage gate in the center of each cell. All but one of these cells are currently occupied by a single humanoid sculpture made of painted concrete. All of these sculptures are located directly above their drainage gate and oriented to face the tower, each one constantly secreting an unknown dark red substance. Inside of the glass tower, the Foundation found a viewing room containing a single human skeleton with a broken neck. It would seem that this silo contains a whole lot of SCP-173 copies, or rather, things that are somewhat similar to SCP-173 but not quite the same. Except for one of them, which managed to escape, snap the Watcher's neck, and flee out through the hatch. This one, of course, was recontained by the Modern Foundation, and ended up being labeled as SCP-173. There's also another similar entity, SCP-3693, which is a statue that can only be observed when your eyes are closed, and those that observe it often report the feeling of being watched. Despite also being found on the same island as the 3220 silo, in a basement of an abandoned warehouse with the corpse of a woman with a broken neck nearby, 3693 has never taken a hostile action while in Foundation custody. Let's move on to another facility, one quite a bit more impressive. SCP-4220 is Earth's moon, which, despite the popular scientific consensus of being the second densest satellite in our solar system, is actually hollow. Despite this fact, the moon exerts a gravitational force significantly more powerful than its mass should permit. A man-made borehole exists on the moon, one meter in diameter and 50 meters in depth, at the bottom of which is a hatch with a placard reading, Department of Abnormalities. Past the hatch is a mechanical airlock, which leads into a sublunar complex built entirely out of beryllium copper. This complex is approximately half a kilometer in diameter and depth and consists of 100 floors separated by a spiral staircase running up the center. The floors all contain several continuous rows of cubicles, each bearing a typewriter, all of which are connected through pneumatic tubes. Additionally, a pair of mechanical brass hands are mounted to each typewriter, and brass shoes are located on the floor underneath. The hands type continually only pausing when two sets of shoes move away from their cubicles and switch places. At the bottom of the facility is a circular balcony surrounding the central pneumatic tube, with the tube continuing down to an unknown depth, sealed off with a mixture of moon rocks and cement. A mechanical dial is affixed to the pipe at this level, labeled as contamination. Since the Foundation has contained the facility, this dial has increased itself from 75 to 85 out of a possible 100, although they have no idea what it's measuring. The other anomaly present here is the entire far side of the moon, but that's been sealed without high-level clearance, so we'll learn about that later. It's unknown when exactly the Foundation learned that the moon was hollow. But by 1960, both the United States and the USSR were aware of it, and knew that the public could never learn of it. Despite this, they still needed to continue the space race and get a man on the moon, otherwise they risked incurring significant socio-cultural and political losses. Publicly, they competed with non-anomalous technology, but privately, scientists on both sides utilized anomalies in order to reach the moon first, discover its true nature, and determine whether it could be weaponized. It's likely that by doing this, they caused the formation of the anomaly on the far side. This is where things get rather interesting, as President JFK authorized a project called Helios in order to get to the moon first, 
putting the occult branch of the Department of Defense in charge. The project was led by Jack Parsons, a noted rocket scientist and one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Lab, who was also heavily involved with the occult. Parsons had died in 1952, but it seems that his spirit was attached to the nose cone of the ship. Don't worry, this hasn't even begun to get weird yet. Project Helio successfully made it to the moon, but crash landed on the surface, killing all onboard personnel and stranding Parsons spirit there. Parsons had declined to share a number of critical elements of Project Helios' design, so the people back on Earth couldn't replicate the rocket used. The Foundation, on the other hand, was working on constructing some bases on the moon, and managed to find the ship's nose cone. They brought it back to Earth and performed a seance to speak with Parsons. Now it starts to get weird. Parsons explains that in the 40s, he and his ex-friend L. Ron Hubbard performed a series of rituals that summoned an elemental spirit, which they tried to have a child with. It seems that the spirit was never able to conceive, and she ran off with Hubbard. Later, Alistair Crowley, a renowned occultist that Parsons was involved with, said that the thing they were trying to conceive was the moon child, leading Parsons to wonder if the real spirit they summoned was actually on the moon. The Department of Defense had captured Parsons' spirit in order to force him to work on the Helios project, but he managed to contact Crowley, who helped him latched on to the nose cone of the ship, without anyone else knowing. When asked about the design of the Helios rocket, Parsons explains that it's basically a mix of thaumaturgy and spiritual energy. I'm skipping over a lot of details in order to stay monetized, but needless to say, a lot of risque elements were at work in the project. Parsons says that the human soul is an indefinite source of kinetic, electrical, and thermal energy, bound by a minimal level of power output. Project Helios broke past the limit, but the problem was that they needed a lot of fresh souls. To get them, they went down the Trail of Tears in order to find ghosts of Native Americans, with the idea that their pent-up rage and hatred would make for good fuel. It's worth noting that the team involved in this consumed a significant amount of recreational drugs in the process. The interviewer says that he finds these actions rather reprehensible, but Parsons counters by saying that this was all approved by the military in order to stop the relentless march of communism. Back to the moon then. In his time spent there stranded, he grew bored and found the borehole leading down into the moon. He suddenly goes quiet, before saying that he went down there and found a tomb. He saw a man down there, or more of a specter, or shade, rent into many little pieces. Each of those pieces is locked in a cage, but he saw the pieces, and they saw him. He says that either this thing forced its way up, or the moon goddess rejected it, but it was never meant to be seen. He finishes by saying that they weren't the first men on the moon, but they should have been the last. The Soviets, on the other hand, tried a different approach of landing on the moon. Necromancy. Utilizing a young girl as a controller, they were able to kill a man and have her control his risen corpse. The idea was that the landing part wouldn't be too important if the occupant was already dead. Their main problem, however, is that this process only lasted for a few hours, so even though they could get a man there by loading him with paralytic agents, they'd only have a few hours once on the moon. Despite this, they did manage to get inside of the facility and find the typewriters, which perplexed them. They wanted a way to keep the corpses around for longer to explore further, and they ended up being introduced to a man who could completely suspend his bodily functions for a length of time. The man offered to teach them how to do this, but he wanted to go to the moon himself, claiming that someone was waiting for him there. The plan worked though, as individuals in this state of suspended animation could be controlled indefinitely by the girl. 
They managed to get a man down to the bottom of the facility on the moon, finding the dial to be set at 25, but it rose to 30 while investigating. The girl controlling the subject complained of a foul odor coming from the shaft leading downwards. Meanwhile, the occultists they had brought in continued to perform bizarre rituals while in their employ. After performing one such ritual and claiming to have opened a channel to his goddess, they found that the dial on the moon was now set at 50, as well as several of the pneumatic tubes having bursted. Also, a black smoke filled the facility that congealed the skin of their man there into tar. Later, the pipes sealed themselves off as if they had never burst, and the smoke was gone. The dial was now at 65, and the typewriters are working at full speed. The girl was much more hesitant about going down the shaft to the bottom, while the occultist continued to perform his rituals. Eventually, the girl controlled a man and had him slide down the single pipe leading underneath the facility, losing much of his skin in the process. They discovered that underneath the facility, the interior of the moon is filled with giant glass chambers, each shaped like a perfect dodecahedron. They couldn't determine how far these chambers spread. Each chamber was connected to four others by means of bronze-colored metal hatches in the corners of each room, with smaller pipes winding through all of the chambers. The entire area was filled with a foul smell which seemed to spread to the girl back on Earth, even after several showers. The next man is sent in with a hazard suit, as the air has become corrosive at this point. They find that some of the glass chambers house smaller glass cages shaped like human organs filled with black smoke. This smoke was being fed into the pipes and pumped into the moon, while other chambers were filled with smoke, pulsing and throbbing. The occultist claims that this place is the resting place of his goddess, who was shredded by a ritual botched by his apprentice. It's clear that this occultist is Aleister Crowley, and after finding him performing a ritual with the young girl, they finally agree to send him to the moon. After arriving in the facility though, he tore out the controlling antenna from his scalp, and proceeded to vent black smoke out of the wound. The girl that was controlling him fainted, with tar oozing from her skin. As Crowley slid down the pipe into the interior of the moon, the Soviets detonated some remote explosives in the shaft, sealing it off. The last image they captured was of the dial at 75. They decided to cancel the project and never return to the moon. The US and the Soviets later get together to agree that they cannot ever go to the moon again, as whatever is up there is far too dangerous and beyond their understanding. Instead, they agree to fake the moon landings, not by faking the landings, but by using a fake moon. They end up using SCP-1812, a large asteroid in orbit around the Earth that can only be seen once you're made aware of it. They then reveal what exactly is on the far side of the moon. A face. Specifically, the face of Aleister Crowley, with an expression of distinct pleasure. Ignoring all the occult weirdness going on here, what we learn is that the Department of Abnormalities was apparently incredibly capable at their jobs. Not only going to the moon before anyone else, but hollowing the entire thing out and using it to contain some sort of cosmic entity. Then they apparently locked it up and threw away the key, only for it to be discovered again by some bumbling governments. The Foundation possibly has the situation contained again, but who knows how many other horrible nightmares have been locked away by the now defunct department. Let's look at one last department SCP which provides a good deal of insight into how they operated. SCP-4099 is initially presented as a notepad filled with illegible writing, which causes people who view it to panic and possibly kill themselves. This, of course, is just obfuscation, with the O5 Council dissuading people from checking it out. 
What it actually is, is a series of documents, consisting of various memos and articles written by members of the Department of Abnormalities. Once again, the Council doesn't want people to learn about the Department, for some reason, although we'll have to hand wave the fact that this is all on the database. The memos are between an Agent Shane and a Dr. Horton, with Shane writing that they picked up three more this week, although Bobby lost his arms to one of them. He also apparently passed Horton some copies of files, but asks why he needs them. Horton writes that he received word that they might be transferring the abnormalities contained in their facility. Shane will apparently have to live in the same facility as the abnormalities he's contained, but Shane writes that he just captures them, it's the researchers that contain them. He later sends a memo asking about how the abnormalities are doing that he captured, which is a rather odd question when it comes to field agents in the Foundation, but this is a different Foundation. Horton replies that the abnormalities are doing fine, but they're acting much differently than they were in the field. He writes that something feels off about them. Shane says that whatever it is, he should make sure he's safe. He's on his way to meet the new general in charge of the operation. In the next memo though, Shane writes that the general issued a termination order on an entire village in Portugal, and Shane followed it. This seems to refer to SCP-002, a large fleshy growth that can kill people and convert them into furniture for its interior. 002 crash landed from space near a small village in Portugal where a General Mulhausen led a squad of SCP personnel to retrieve it. Mulhausen proceeded to issue a termination order for any witnesses to the event, which seems to be what Shane is referring to. Fans of the modern SCP Foundation will no doubt raise an eyebrow at this, as the Foundation practically never terminates witnesses, instead preferring to amnesticize them. SCP-002 is obviously a very early SCP, but it seems that according to 4099, it actually predates the modern foundation, instead being handled by the Department of Abnormalities. Unlike most other things handled by them though, this one ended up still in foundation hands. Shane proceeded to kill Mulhausen, and wonders why Horton isn't responding to his calls or memos. We're then given a series of short documents resembling SCP articles, but with different formatting. In fact, the format is the same as one of the SCP-001 proposals, the prototype, which is depicted as one of the very first anomalies that the Foundation contained. It's noted that none of these entities listed in these documents are contained by the Foundation. The first is a hostile humanoid entity wearing a uniform typical of air raid wardens used in the 1940s. Its pockets are filled with bullets and it emits small doses of gamma radiation, with its palms covered in a caustic adhesive that burns human skin on contact. It was first seen by tourists at a diner in Nevada. The department came in to contain it, utilizing some new containment protocols developed by the late Dr. Ketter. I'll note that Dr. Ketter died during the initial testing of the prototype SCP, which means that this occurred afterwards. The second entity is a hostile emaciated humanoid with elongated arms and almost no orifices across its body. It displays considerable strength for its body structure, and also temporarily takes on some certain traits of whatever animal it eats including intelligence when eating a human. The third object is a small vase of roses, which emits a large amount of gamma radiation. Essentially, anyone who comes near it dies in a pretty messy way, but then reanimates and attacks people. These are some really basic anomalies, which is quite in line with the prototype. The idea of anomalies becoming more and more unusual and involved over time is not a new one, both in-universe and out-of-universe, so it seems that most of the things contained by the department were pretty simple. At the same time though, they seem to handily contain Lucifer's sword, Apollyon's crown, and some sort of cosmic moon entity. 
On the back of one of the documents is the address of a facility mentioned in the memos, so the Foundation sent in an MTF to check it out. The team is sent to Pripyat in the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine, where the team lead says that whatever they find here, Overwatch wants it to be kept quiet, so they either lock it up or terminate it. In the middle of Pripyat, they find a maintenance elevator surrounded by glass, which seems to be their destination. They press the single button on the elevator and wait three minutes for the doors to open. Inside, they find a keypad, and Overwatch Command provides a four-digit code for them to use, although how they got this code isn't mentioned. The team takes the elevator down for three minutes, while an automated message reads, Welcome to the Department of Abnormalities, over and over again, in English and Russian. When they reach the bottom, they enter into a dark and abandoned facility, where they find the three objects described in the earlier documents, locked up in cells. They also find a sealed door with a placard reading, Absence. As the group splits up, two of them find a note on the floor next to the locked door of the director's office. The other two find a large server room with a glowing red button on one of the servers, emitting a humming sound. As is dictated in Foundation Protocol, whenever you find a glowing red button in a creepy abandoned facility, you must press it. So they do. This seems to automatically open all of the cells for some reason, leading most of the team to be slaughtered. The note they recovered was written by Dr. Howard Snorlison, head of the Department of Abnormalities, announcing his resignation to the regional director. He writes that he cannot do this anymore, as these things are not normal, even by their standards. Every time he goes to bed, he has nightmares about these abominations, and it's too much for him to bear. While this article presents the Department of Abnormalities as a very human precursor to the modern Foundation, I'll once again iterate that nothing is canon, so this could just be ignored entirely if you want. With that in mind, we don't really know much about the department, and that's the point. They seem to be defunct, and in their time they accomplished some incredible feats of containment before vanishing almost entirely. As for why they disappeared without leaving some proper notes, we may never know. The Department of Abnormalities in general is a callback to the early days of the SCP Wiki, when things weren't meant to be explained, when some things were just locked away and better left ignored. Chances are good we'll continue to pick up pieces of the department and their deeds left behind, and it's possible that someday we'll learn a little bit more about what happened to them, but it's likely that they, much like the abnormalities they contained, are better left forgotten.